Howdy folks. So uh, I know it's been a long time, but uh, I wanted to talk about uh, a project that has been sort of ongoing, and uh, that is my Wi-Fi plant monitor project. So this um, is a sort of module you can buy uh, off of eBay. Um, it goes under a couple different names, but the, uh, the one that I have here is called High Grow. Um, and you can look around for this, and it's supposedly some sort of open source um, Wi-Fi plant monitor solution. Uh, however, it uh, doesn't really seem to, seems to be sort of vaporware at the moment. Um, but you can buy the hardware off of eBay. Um, whether this is official hardware or not, I'm not really quite sure, but, um, you know, you get something. And uh, so these are about $20 Canadian each, and uh, this is all you get in the, in the package, basically. Uh, it's just an ESD bag with this. And uh, this is an ESP32-based um, Wi-Fi plant monitor. So the idea here is that you stick this in the ground, and uh, you put an 18650 in the cell holder here, and it monitors the uh, soil moisture, the uh, air temperature and the air humidity, and it reports it uh, back over Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to some sort of uh, you know server app, web service, whatever it might be, and uh, it allows you to you know log uh, all those statistics over time, and it can you know send you alerts if you need to water your plants or whatever it might be, and you could have like an array of these things, and you know you can know, have some sort of like one nice interface that gives you stats of all your stuff. And so anyway, I bought two of these, um, and uh, this one is labeled number two. So number one is actually currently running. I have it on one of my plants, and uh, this unit is number two. And uh, the reason why it's not running is because there is actually, there are some problems with this actual hardware. Um, so I'm going to be sort of using this to uh, explain, you know, what this is and what I've found um, through my investigation. There isn't really, there's no, of course, there's no documentation that comes with this, and uh, the software that this thing comes with um, it is loaded with an Arduino sketch um, from the factory, which doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. Um, I don't know if it's trying to connect to a specific Wi-Fi network uh, or something, but it basically it, it tries to boot and doesn't really go anywhere. Uh, but it does have the Arduino bootloader on it. So I originally started with Arduino, and the there is sort of like there's a repo with like a single file reference sketch, um, which doesn't compile. It doesn't actually work. Um, and it looks really horrible. It looks like the person who wrote it just sort of copy-pasted a bunch of stuff off Stack Overflow and just mushed it together. Didn't really know what they were doing kind of a thing. Um, but I managed to get it to compile, and I was able to read the sensor data. Um, but as soon as I tried to turn Wi-Fi on and other things, um, I started seeing all sorts of strange memory corruption issues, and, and stuff got really weird really fast. And so I really... I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the Arduino thing anyway, so I... Uh, I wanted to try out MicroPython. It's something that I might be using at work in the future. And so I thought I you know, might as well use this as an opportunity to try it out. Um, I'd used it on another ESP32 dev board that I have, um, but I wanted to actually try and do something, you know, something more serious with it. And so I loaded it on here. You can use the ESP tool and just you know, flash, uh, flash the, uh, the, the flash memory with uh, just sort of the stock, the stock image. And stock image comes with, uh, you know, enough to get readings from the sensors. Uh, and, and I'll explain what, what they are in just a moment. And uh, I ended up having to actually build micro, my, MicroPython uh, from source uh, myself because one of the sort of really important uh, functionality of the uh, ESP32 that I need for this project is the deep sleep mode. Because, of course, if this thing is going to get any reasonable uh, amount of battery life off of a single 18650 cell, um, this thing is going to have to be in deep sleep, aka basically off most of the time. And MicroPython currently stable uh, does not have support for that. Uh, however, there is code available on GitHub, um, you know, on on you know, developer branches uh, that you can try out. And so I ended up having to learn how to build MicroPython um, with that functionality in um, using the Expressive SDK. And I was able to compile something that did have the deep sleep functionality, and I was able to use it. And um, so I, I ended up writing a, a simple boot.py for this, which reads data from the sensors and posts it as JSON to a PHP script on a web server that logs it into a MariaDB database. And so I, I have got data logging working on these. And uh, I basically, I wake this thing up every 30 minutes to take a measurement, and then it goes back to sleep. And uh, so 
that's basically how far I've gotten so far, um, functionality wise. But uh, now I kind of want to go over a little bit more of the details um, of what I've noticed on these boards. Um, and uh, they aren't they aren't perfect. There, there are definitely problems that I'm going to have to solve with these boards uh, in their current state. I don't know if they're going to revise this board at any point in time. Uh, likely they'll, they're going to have to because they're going to have to solve um, some of the problems uh, that, that I'm about to go over. So, uh, first of all, um, sensors, of course, super important. So, for the uh, temperature and humidity, they've gone for a DHT11, which is, you know, super bog standard uh, analog sensor here. Um, both of my boards happened to, as you can see, the ground uh, pin here, it's soldered on the back, but it is not soldered on the front. Both of my boards had that, so clearly the solder quality, the, the hand solder quality is not super great on these. And uh, so that's pretty straightforward. MicroPython actually has a, uh, a driver uh, built in for that. Um, and it's not that hard to read that uh, anyway. So if you're, if you're using Arduino, of course, there's uh, lots of drivers for that out there as well. And for the uh, soil uh, moisture, this is actually a capacitive sensor. So if you actually look in the light, you can actually see there are two elements here. There's a center element, and then there is uh, another trace that goes all the way around. And uh, this forms a, effectively a capacitor. And this chip here is uh, the beloved triple five timer. Um, you know, spared no expense on this one. So basically what they're doing is they've got two resistors here. Uh, and uh, this is the main tank cap for the triple five. And so uh, it's basically running uh, as an A-stable uh, vibra uh, a sta in A-stable mode. And so basically it, it's sort of self-oscillating with this uh, with this capacitor and those timing resistors. And so as you basically, as you bring water in proximity of this, um, and by proximity, I mean, it really has to be pr almost touching this, um, it will change, you know, the dielectric constant will change and this um, timer will run at a different frequency. And they've got an RC oscillator on the output of that. And uh, that effectively generates a, you know, as, as a low pass filter. So it generates a, a relatively stable analog voltage. And they've routed that, uh, that analog voltage out to pin, I think it's 32, uh, on the ESP, which is uh, one of the uh, analog to digital channels uh, on the ESP. Now, that output is 2.6 volts um, nominal with nothing on this. And uh, anyone who's worked with the ESP32 knows that that's above the maximum input for the uh, A to D. It's a 0 to 1 volt A to D. And uh, this kind of confused me at first. Uh, because I wasn't quite sure how they were how they were getting the measurements, because the Arduino sketch uh, was getting correct measurements, but my MicroPython wasn't. And as it turns out, uh, this relies on you adding an 11 dB input attenuator um, in software, and uh, it, it, you do get some weird lo like nonlinearity when you do that. But it's of course this is a very crude sensor anyway, so it does work fine. Uh, and there is some sort of undocumented MicroPython parameters you can use when you set up the A to D to actually do that. Um, so it is supported, but it's a, a little bit odd. Um, so I, I ended up having to sort of figure that out. Uh, but this seems to be pretty good. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll insert a picture of uh, uh, a graph I took of some data, and you can see that there's a dip in the reading. Uh, when I watered my plant. So you can clearly see that it is working and that's with this in a plastic bag. So the way that I'm currently using these is because I like to keep these nice and clean while I'm doing development. I'm actually just putting these in a Ziploc bag and shoving them into the into the soil. Um, you could probably put these directly into the soil um, and you'd get a probably a much stronger reading. But uh, until, you know, and, and until I'm done with these, I want to keep them nice and clean. So I'm, I'm just putting them in a bag and it works for now. So that's how they're taking care of those sensors. Um, as for the rest of the stuff on the board here, uh, we have sort of your uh, bog standard uh, AMS1117 3.3 volt LDO. And of course, when you put your, uh, you know, your, your 18650 cell in here, of course, this is going to go down to about 3 volts. And of course, so this is going to drop out. And uh, it will continue to run. The ESP will keep running down to about 2.9 volts-ish, uh, seems to be where they brown out at. You can actually measure the battery voltage using the internal A to D in the ESP. Um, so you can have it like send you an alert telling you the battery is low. Um, in addition, of course, we have uh, this is a Scilab CP2102. CP2102. It's the exact same uh, USB to serial converter chip that I featured in one of my last videos about that RS485 transceiver. It's the exact same chip. And uh, that's 
uh, what's connected to this uh, USB uh, micro B here. And of course, that allows you to do the programming with you know, ESP tool um, and you know, whatever other tool you want. Um, and of course, it allows you to do you know, MicroPython, MicroPython console, all sorts of stuff. Um, so it's nice that they have that. Um, this is also tied into the regulator. So you can, you can actually power this without a cell in it, and it will be fully functional. Um, and you can actually switch between the cell and this. Um, and so it looks like it's, uh, it's just diode ord. So um, you can use one or the other. And um, what else? Uh, there's a switch here. This is actually for switching on the, uh, the, all the circuitry. So basically, the output of the regulator goes through this switch. So you can uh, fully turn off the power uh, with this, which is quite nice. Um, it's got two LEDs here, two green LEDs, and uh, uh, a blue LED. The blue LED is on pin 16 for the ESP. Um, one of the green LEDs is the USB power, and the other LED, I believe, is connected to the uh, Scilabs chip. So I just realized uh, that there is another chip on the board. Um, apparently I'm blind. Um, and so this is actually a, a TP5410, which is a, a LiPo charge chip. So um, I believe that uh, the LEDs are actually driven from this, uh, from this chip um, and not from the, uh, the Scilabs chip. And so this would be providing um, the charge. So actually, um, you know, I, I sort of immediately disproved my own um, theory. Uh, it will not overcharge the cells because it actually does have a proper uh, proper charge chip on there, which is, is good. Um, it also has uh, two bu buttons, which of course is nice. So you got the boot button, which you can hold down when you boot the unit, um, and it will take you into the ESP bootloader. And it's got the sort of the enable button, which is basically just the reset button, um, which uh, is quite handy. Um, you've got all the pins, and they appear to be labeled correctly, um, which is kind of nice. They're labeled on both sides, and it's got a, just a standard battery holder. Um, there is no double-sided sensor. It is just on one side of the board, uh, but it appears to be a four-layer board um, because uh, there are traces that I don't see on both sides. So I think this is actually four layers, um, which is uh, kind of more than I would have expected. They probably should be able to do this in just two, but anyway. Um, the the ESP32 uh, that it comes with is a Rev1 chip, so um, it's not a Rev0, um, which is nice. Uh, this one, as you can see, is not straight, um, but under the microscope, all of the all of the castellated vias have been soldered um, correctly. Um, it, it just looks bad. Um, but uh, this ESP, I believe, is defective, um, and that's why this unit is not currently running, uh, because this thing appears to uh, it sort of it, it just crashes randomly. Sometimes on boot, it doesn't fully boot or the Wi-Fi will just go down and it won't be able to see stations anymore. Um, I've had this thing hang several times. And um, unfortunately, the thing with MicroPython is that um, if you set up a watchdog in MicroPython, you need it to boot, you know, free RTOS, and then start the MicroPython task, because that's how it works on the ESP32. It's just a free RTOS task. You have to get that far through the boot process um, for it to set up your watchdogs. And so if it doesn't get that far, um, the system, it'll never actually watchdog. Um, of course, you shouldn't rely on watchdogs. Um, I mean, if there's something clearly wrong, like there is in this case, but, uh, you know, it's a, another concern. Um, so I, I might, I might actually just abandon this whole MicroPython thing. I think I've learned what I kind of want to learn from it. Um, and I may just go back to using the raw Espressif free RTOS SDK and just writing, you know, like bare metal C stuff on this. Um, which would probably be, uh, you know, be, it would be more power efficient. It would probably be more rel more reliable, definitely. Um, but uh, I think it's this particular board and not the other, and, and not the sort of the software architecture in general, because the other board has been running for a couple days now, and it's fine. Um, so I have another, like I said, um, I tried MicroPython originally on another ESP dev board. It's got a Rev0 chip on it. And anyway, I might actually uh, take that chip off and put this, or uh, take that module off and, put it on here to try and salvage this board because uh, the, the board's about 20 bucks and the other module's not worth nearly that much. So I might just move them around and see if see if the problem is on the board or if it's on the module. I'm, I can't be quite sure, to be honest. Um, so the other, uh, I guess one other major problem that I have noticed, which will require a hardware modification, um, has to do with power management. So like I said, this thing uh, needs, basically needs to be in deep sleep because this thing, you know, when it's running, um, draws, you know, upwards of 200 milliamps out of the cell, which is, you know, 
a, a lot. Um, and, you know, on a standard cell, it's going to be dead in like 12 hours. Uh, so really, you need, you need this thing to be in deep sleep as much as possible, wake it up, you know, every half hour, every hour, something like that. Um, and the ESP32 can do that because it has uh, an internal uh, RTC, which basically can generate a, a, an alarm, like an alarm, effectively an interrupt, which can wake up the processor and it will effectively boot fresh. So there, the RAM is actually cleared uh, when you will wake up from deep sleep. There is a sort of a scratch pad in the RTC where you can store uh, like values and retrieve them. So you can store persistent state um, as well as the time um, from after deep sleep, but everything else is cleared. So it's basically a clean boot every time the thing wakes up. But for something like this, it doesn't really need to even know the time because um, in my case, I use the server to inject the time into the database um, rather than this thing uh, needing to know what the actual time is. So this thing doesn't even bother with that. And so, yeah, so it basically just, it just wakes up, connects to the uh, Wi-Fi access point, measures the sensors, sends the JSON. When it gets the 200 status code, goes back to sleep. And uh, if, if it doesn't get a 200, it tries a couple times, and then eventually it'll give up if it, if it can't connect for something like that. Uh, and the problem that I realized was that even with this thing in deep sleep, this board still draws over 20 milliamps. And the reason, uh, after buzzing it out with my multimeter, is that they are running the triple five and the DHT11 directly off of the output of the LDO. So there is no, there's no software switch um, to uh, enable or disable power to the sensors, um, which is a, a major problem. So I'm going to be adding a, just, a, like just a FET on one of the GPIOs that can switch the output of the regulator um, to just the two sensors. Uh, and that should be enough to cut that back drastically um, to the point where I think the power management will be sufficient for my needs on the cells that I'll be putting in here. Um, so I, I will update you when I actually do those mods um, and uh, probably when I finish my firmware. Um, I'll publish it, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, these things, uh, they're, they're cool. And I think that they have some, you know, there's, there's some, some promise to this. Um, I will be probably buying more of these in the future once I, re once I figure out that I absolutely can get these things the way I want. Um, and I'll just put them everywhere and it'll be uh, kind of fun. Then it'll just be like a web app building a nice little interface for it. Um, they, uh, they, uh, you know, of course they're designed for in internal use, but I mean, you could, you could technically use this outside if you wanted to. Um, I don't know how much value there'd be, but you could, um, you could sort of like manually conformally coat this, um, or pot it basically. Uh, I've done that where I, you just take like a, a cardboard box or like a tube or something, you put it around it and then you just get that two part epoxy from uh, like your dollar store and you just fill it up. Um, and uh, it's, it's not re-enterable. So it's definitely permanent once you do that. Um, but it is cheap way to pot stuff. Uh, of course, you know, you'd, 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 you'd need some way to charge the battery if you, of course, because the battery is going to be encased in it. Um, maybe you could have like an inductive charging loop or something like that, or maybe just a connector. I don't know. Um, how you would protect this sensor, I really don't know. Um, you might want to just put like a hat or something, because if this is in the ground, um, the you know, water is probably going to come from the top. So if it's a, a hat that's open on the bottom, you'd probably be okay, because it's unlikely the water is going to spray up from the bottom. So you could sort of weatherproof this, like maybe if you want to put on your deck or on your balcony or something, um, you could do it. But uh, yeah, I mean, I chose, and I, of course, I know there's people that are going to say, oh, well, there are, there are devices out there like this that you can buy pre-made from companies. Um, and I, of course, I know that. Uh, and there, there's, there's, there's two big reasons why I didn't buy those. Um, the first one is, of course, I want to be able to build my own software stack so that I can configure it um, and I can add my own other sensor. So I could add maybe like a light sensor to sense how much you know, ambient light the, the plant is getting, uh, the spectrum of the light. I, could, I can configure what service it reports to and, of course, I can write my own service, um, whether it be a web app, a phone app, whatever it is. I, I can control that and I have access to the data and all that stuff. And, of course, I like that because it's, you know, it gives me control. It allows me to do what I want to do. And the other big reason is because this is a capacitive sensor. And a lot of the ones that I see uh, for sale use, um, they use sort of like a galvanic sensor. They just have like a, a copper and a zinc um, uh, electrode that you jam in the ground. And it basically uses the, the water in the soil as an electrolyte and it measures the voltage. And that's, um, you know, that, that gives you the amount of water. But of course, that effectively being a battery um, it wears out, um, the actual, the, the, it effectively corrodes um, in the soil. 
and it's it's effectively it's a disposable sensor. And so this thing being capacitive, this technically never needs to touch water. It's why I'm running it in like a Ziploc bag and it's okay. Um, so this should theoretically last a lot longer, um, uh, technically indefinitely, as long as I don't splash water on this. Um, and that's that's kind of the, the big uh, reason why I went for these. So anyway, um, I think I've rambled on for enough time without actually um, delivering on anything, so I will uh, get back to this project and uh, I'll update you once I have uh, more interesting uh, results. So, as always, thanks for watching.